Is this even? Is this even? Yeah, that's even. What's up, guys? What's up, guys? How are you guys doing today? Great. How are you? How's the world? Hi. How are you? I'm really excited. I'm excited. I got some, I got some notes. I got everything prepped up. Everyone have a pen and piece of paper. Give it like five more minutes. Wait for everyone else. Ooh. What do you got for us, Sensei Ray? Oh man, I got fire straight from TV. How's your day looking? Yo, what's up? Good. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Oh, Control and the problems with waiting. Tax control. The problems with waiting. That sounds good. Yeah. There's there's a few issues with waiting. 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 Yeah. You know. Yeah. Have you ever been hit like I can just do this later? Uh, I mean, I'll wait on it. I'm still pretty young. I don't really need life insurance. Everyone gets hit with that. That's just become. We've got work life insurance. We're covered. Yeah, man. Who, who cares about work life? This is straight from TV, dude. I'm telling you, like, I was looking through all my notes yesterday. And I was like, man, what is the most fire thing that I can go over today? And this is it. Ooh, I think some more people are in here. What's up, guys? My man, Marquise. Reiki Reich. I miss you, man. When you I miss you more, man. How you been? Oh, dude, I, I genuinely miss you. I saw Christina, and I didn't see you, and I was like, what is this, dude? Oh, what yeah, no, you know I wasn't going to miss it. Man, thanks, man. I appreciate you. You're, you're <laughs> the best, dog. You keep your chin up, right? You too, you too. It's, like, weird, because I keep looking over here, but the camera's right there. Can you turn on the screen? Dude, you're right. <laughs> I was gonna say, why don't you put on the TV? That's why it's there, yeah. Two steps ahead, guys. Two steps ahead. <laughs> Stop, you want to help me with that one? Yeah, I don't watch them do this because I've never done that before. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, right on time. Perfect. <laughs> nah, I got it. I got it. I think so. You know, it's all right. Yeah, it's cool. All right, everyone, show some face. Uh, I, I think it's very disrespectful to hop on a workshop and not show the screen. Talk about. Faye Jones, Marvin Mondragon, and Rich. Put your screens on. For sure. The 
If you see someone, can you just admit them then? Uh, so what's up, guys? So I'll kind of go ahead and get started. Uh, it's 10.02. So what we'll kind of be going over today is uh, a few things. One of the big things I wanted to go over was the tax control triangle. Now, I'm sure we all know, like, there's a lot of investments out there that we can put our money into. You know, there's like stocks, bonds, life insurance. But there's three main areas where all investments really kind of fall into, and including life insurance. So... It all comes down to this big triangle, and I'm not, I'm not too good at geometry, so don't mind the triangle. But uh, first area that everyone uh, puts their money into is uh, an area where it's pre-tax, pre-tax income, and it all you put it in, it comes out deferred. That means you put the money in before you ever pay taxes on it. A lot of times, like from your employer before you even get your paycheck. And all the money you put in is deferred. So you're not paying taxes on it while you're putting it through the investment. Now, when you do pull the money out, this comes out as taxable income. Now, these are like your 401ks, guys, 403bs, 407, uh, 457cs. And uh, you guys, I'm sure you guys all know like what a 401k is, right? Everyone knows like that's an investment, uh, like a retirement program offered through work. A lot of times they match a certain percentage up to like three to 5% sometimes, whatever it is. And they take that out of your annual income, right? Now, a 403b is like what teachers and state employees file. Steve McHugh, let that person in. Um, like state employees, teachers, uh, even some nurses file 403Bs. And the last one's like four, uh, 457s. And that's like for, uh, you know, it, it's just like for state employees as well. Like if you ever sit down with an ASCII member, those are state employees. So those guys are, uh, they, they all file 457s. And a few other things that go along with that are traditional IRAs. Uh, an SEP, that's a self-employed pension IRA. That's what we file, guys. We're all 1099s here. So that's what we would file if we wanted an investment account. And um, for our unions, because that's what we sit down with, right? They all have pensions. And that's another thing that gets taxed out as income. And what they call this is um, an OEI. It's a ordinary earned income taxable. And that all depends on how much income you've made. You know, if you started off and you only made like $30,000 a year, you're really not going to be paying a lot of taxes when you take all this out because you're at a low tax rate. But if you want to keep the lifestyle you have and, you know, when you retire, you want to pull a lot of money out of this, you're going to be paying quite a high level of taxes. If you're making like a hundred K and you're trying to live a hundred K lifestyle until you like you're dead, you're going to start paying a lot of taxes. You're at a different tax bracket on your ordinary earned income. Does that make sense guys? Any questions on that? Um, cool. Cool. So that's the first area you can put your money into. Now, the next area is something that we all know. This is post-tax income. Put it in. Third, and it actually comes out as taxable. But these are like your investments, you know, like, uh, like your stocks, your bonds. Does anyone know any other few investments that are like, you have post-tax money, you put it out, and it comes out taxable. Real estate? Real estate, exactly. So stocks, bonds, real estate. Anyone else? Anyone have any other guesses? Anyone on the screen? No? Yes? Commodities. Commodities, exactly. CDs. A bunch of things. You get CDs, real estate, mutual funds. Um, what else gets on there? Stocks. And if you guys are like me, you guys like have like cryptocurrency. If you guys have a bunch of like Dogecoin, Bitcoin, all that, that's all, that's all right here. This is your post-tax income. That's all going to be taxed as, uh, it's all tax deferred, but the only thing you do get taxed on guys is the gains on the tax. You want to let the patent in as well? You get taxed on the gains. So you put this money in because you already pay taxes on it, right? And then it's growing, it's growing, it's growing. You're not, 
let's say you put $20,000 into here. You put $20,000 and at the end of five years, it's $30,000. You're not gonna pay taxes on $30,000. You're only gonna be pay taxing, taxes on the $10,000 of the money that grew. So that's all taxable. And there's two kinds of taxes that deal with this. There's short-term gains, and then there's long-term gains. Anyone familiar with those, short and long-term? You, you guys can get hit with these. Like if you sit down with a really well-off family and they're like, well, I have, I, have a, I have a really good 401k and I have stocks, so I'm good. Like I don't need life insurance. And this is where the problem is. So if, let's say they have short-term gains. They made a bunch of money really, really fast in one year. If they made anything over $40,000, they're taxed at under, actually under $40,000, it's a 0% short-term gains. But now let's say if you make anywhere from 40 to 450, you're looking at 15% tax. And that's where everyone typically lies on their short-term gains unless like you're, you're a dog and you made a, like millions of dollars within a year, right? And then the last thing is if you make anything over $450,000, you'll actually pay 20% taxes on that. So I'll kind of write that up. So 40K, 0%, 40K plus, 15%. And that's for short-term gains? Yeah, that's for short-term. And 20% plus. Now, People always say like, you ever like watch the news and someone's like, well, Bill Gates didn't pay any taxes. Bill Gates paid less taxes than his secretary did. Everyone's heard that, right? You wanna let those last two people in as well? The reason being is, is cause Bill Gates is a smart guy. He put all his money into long-term gains taxes and those are taxed at a significantly different rate. Now, uh, the, I'm sorry, that was, this was long-term, I lied. This was your long-term, my fault. Your short term, these are these are like long term rates. Not I switched that up, guys. The long term rates are forty to zero percent. Anything over forty k is fifteen percent, and anything over four hundred fifty k, you're at twenty percent, which is pretty reasonable. But then, let's say your short term, and you make anything, let's say you make ten k, you get taxed ten percent. That's a lot. You make ten grand, you have the, you owe the government a thousand dollars. You make forty k. 12%. You're at 80K, you're paying 22%. You get 160, let's say even $200,000, you guys are paying 30% gains. Jeez. And anything over $500,000, you'll pay over 35% gains. Good God. Now people say like they have investments and stuff and they're liquid, but like, let's say if you made a lot of money that year on just your gains, you, you shorted, you bought some certain stock, you bought a bunch of Tesla, whatever it is. And you're like, well, I'm good. I have this money that I can just take out whenever I want. Well, let's say you made $200,000. You can take out that 200 grand, but you're, you're only really gonna get just about like 140,000 of that. So it, it, it's a give and take. And the last area guys that I'll, I'll actually go over to short term. Short term, yeah, like that, get taxed a lot. And the last area we go to is your after-tax money, post-tax money that comes out tax-free. Now, does anyone know any investments that you can put in that's post-tax that comes out tax rate? Life insurance. Life insurance, specifically? Whole life. Whole life. Cash value life insurance. Does anyone know anything else? Do you want to let Matt Jansen? Municipal bonds, muni bonds, these are triple tax exempt. And that just means muni bonds are exempt from municipal tax, state tax, and federal tax. Uh, the best way to look at um, a municipal bond, it's like if you're an investor, you gave money to the government and, and they're gonna pay you back completely tax free because you're, you're letting the government borrow your money. A lot of times when you get muni bonds, they're like, they're like the money actually goes to like really cool things for like your neighborhood. It's like uh, schools, bridges, parks, like uh, water, like every, everything, you know? Uh, a lot of it goes to just the state and the area around you for municipal, which is really cool. So um, 
And then the next thing is that you can put in is, do you guys know? One other investment you can put in. It's like the one other big thing that's besides that everyone puts their money in if they're, in, if they're gonna retire. Is it a Roth? Does anyone know on Zoom? Oh, Roth IRA. Roth IRA, Stephen Ellis, you're right. You put your money in a Roth IRA. Now these are all cool and I'm gonna teach you how to beat up what these are. Cause a lot of people do put their money in this and they're like, if I have a Roth IRA, I don't need to, I'm good. It's, it's cool. Problems with the Roth IRA guys. Now it's good. Cause you know, if you start off in a lower tax bracket, you just pay taxes when you put the money in. Like if you are a low tax bracket, like if we're all young right now, we're not making anything over like a quarter million or anything like that. You, you, you should get a Roth IRA. Like it's a great investment. You're going to pay taxes right now on it. And when you become rich, you'll pay no taxes on it. Super good investment. Only thing is there's a cap to it. You can only put an X amount of money in every single year. And let's say uh, if you're a single, like a depend, uh, like a, you're independent, file completely by yourself. You can, if you make over $140,000, you actually can't qualify to put money in your Roth IRA. Right? Uh, 150 if you're uh, over the age of 50 plus. So you can't put money in a Roth IRA if you make over 140? 140 is 150. And that's because you would have to go into a traditional IRA. Because why the government doesn't want you to put a bunch of money into something that is that they can't take taxes on, you know? It wouldn't make sense. So after $140,000, you can't qualify. Now, if you're married and you're a couple, after two hundred and ten thousand dollars, you can't qualify. So, if, what if you start putting money in a Roth IRA when you're making less than one hundred forty thousand dollars, and then you get to the point where you're making over one hundred forty thousand dollars? Great question. So you can't. You can't. Uh, the only thing is, you can't contribute to the IRA anymore. Okay. So, so you still have it. It's not like they make you liquidate the Roth IRA. It's like you just can't contribute to it. Like, uh, uh, it's a great investment, especially if you like. We're all young right now. But the, get into a Roth IRA, especially if you get into like right before you become an MGA, you know, when you become an MGA, you're bound not to be able to qualify for a Roth IRA anymore. So make sure you get that done sooner than later. And like I said, there's, there's a few, there's a few checks and balances with it. You can only put up to $6,000 a year if you're under the age of 50 and $7,000 a year if you're over the age of 50. Now they just changed that really recently in the past, like two, three years for the past, like 20 plus years, there's only $5,000. You can only put five thousand dollars at most every single year into your Roth, With, and, and it's still a lot of money. You know, it's that's like uh, over time it builds really fast. But um, there's another issue with this. There's a cap, and uh, guys, if you if you have to guess, like this is based on what our taxes are right now. If you have to guess, if we have to put money into this later, do you think our taxes are going to be higher or lower? Higher. Higher. So we wanna make sure we get people get this done earlier. If you sit down with a family and they're like, well, I just set up a Roth IRA and they're in their forties. This is a great way to beat it up. Well, oh, that's, that's a great investment there, Mary. hundred percent, you know, you should definitely keep that. But uh, the thing is, with the Roth IRA, we're, we're only limited to put an X amount of money in there. And the way, the way we put our taxes, the way the taxes are set up, we're supposed to try to get our Roth IRA in as a, at a lower tax rate, at a lower tax bracket, and unfortunately, we just got this last year, and if I ask you, if you know about how much you're contributing every year, a lot of people don't max out their Roth IRA. <laughs> They'll be like, "Oh, I think I'm, I think I'm putting a thousand dollars." You get a thousand dollars every single year, and it, let's let's say it grows at ten percent, very generously, right? Still seven point two something years before your before your money's gonna double, and it, it's really not that much. If you if you look at it, you're retiring. It, it's really not that much. And then the last thing you can put, uh, there's two other things. There's like a college savings account. And like very few of these are like post tax, tax free. It's very, it, it's fickle because you have to do it directly for your kid's college. You can't use it towards anything else. So college savings. And then like I said, your cash value life insurance. Now, if you have to guess guys, where do you think most people put their money into? IRAs. IRAs. Exactly. As a matter of fact, the government really, really, really pushed people to put their money into their IRAs, their 401ks, their 403bs, their SEPs, their pensions. Reason being is because they knew 
whoa, 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 guys, they're, we're not gonna, we're not gonna take any money from them now, but when their money gets a lot bigger, we'll just start taking a lot more chunks of it, like higher taxes on it. Now, guys, this is tax at ordinary income rates. So this is like, when you wanna pull this out, let's say if you were making $100,000, $150,000 a year, you're paying that same tax bracket at, at your retirement. And that's no good. Now, let's say if you, let's say, yeah, you wanna retire off $100,000 a year. For you to retire off $100,000, you would typically have to get about $130,000 out. And at the end of it, you're paying like $30,000 in taxes. Now, what this triangle does is actually allow you to have some control over this. Now, do, do you guys have this down? Is it cool if I erase this? Or do you guys want to give it another second? Yeah, good. Thumbs up for sure. Cool, guys. So that's your tax control triangle. Now, actually, I'll be able to do like the same thing. Well, let's say let's say you want to retire off $100,000 and you're really going to try to, you're, you're, you're trying to differentiate. You're not trying to take all your money out of your 401k. Now this way you, you want to, you want to retire off a hundred thousand, but now you can take only $115,000 out and only pay $15,000 in taxes. Now you can take, you know, let's say you, you'll take your $70,000 from here, right? 70 grand from there. Your, uh, $15,000 from your taxable income, right? Your, like your stocks and stuff. And then what's 1585, 115, is that, that's 30, right? 30,000? Yeah. It's another $30,000 you're gonna take from here. Now, instead of paying $30,000 in taxes, you're only paying $15,000 in taxes because you're just taking money out of different areas for yourself. And you sit down with someone who's very well off they don't know that. They don't know what this is. They're like, I'll just, I was just going to pay my taxes. You show them this, they're going to be like, what? Uh, I should be doing this. Like, this is, this is very, very important. And one of the big things that people always did with like the government specifically is when they told all the families to invest into this, they didn't tell them they can't invest into this for their life. They said, Hey guys, um, correct me if I'm wrong at the age of 55 and a half, I think you are allowed access to start taking, uh, say, taking like payments out of the, uh, 401k 59, 59, sorry, 59 and a half. And at the age of 72 or 72 and a half, if you don't take it out, they're going to penalize you. They force you to actually take withdrawals from the account. They don't let you just keep investing into it. And next thing here is. The problem is with uh, like this tax free portion, there's caps on everything. You can't put a million dollars into your cash value life insurance one year and then 500,000 next year, or else it's not a cash value life insurance. You have to put a steady premium in every single month. Wow. Your municipal bonds, you, you, it's the same thing. You can't put that, you can't take, you can't get like a huge municipal bond. They, they cap everything. And same thing with your Roth IRA, it's kind of like we went over. So the main thing is guys, what we want our clients to do because we sit down with union families, guys. These are the people that need the insurance the most. I have everyone we sat down with, you sit down with them, you're like, guys, they, they need the insurance. They have a term policy from State Farm and they don't even know what they're doing, all this. They need the insurance the most, but they're also the same people who need to retire with tax-free investments. Because they're not the same, they're not people who are crazy well off or living in like quarter million dollar homes and like, like really nice suburbs and they're, and they own a boat or something. That's not the case, guys. These are these are hardworking, everyday folks. Like they, they don't have the money to go shell out thirty something percent on taxes just because they want to retire a little bit early, you know. So that way, you guys are able to actually control all the taxes in this. And this is what we call the tax control triangle. It's not that good of a triangle, but you guys get the point. Does that make sense? Can you guys see this clearly on the whiteboard, on like the Zoom? You guys can all see that clearly? For sure. All right, guys. Um, any questions on the tax control triangle? Yeah, but who usually gets mad? I guess, yeah, that gets me angry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what's up? What's up, Sauce? I'm not Sauce, uh, Shitty. <laughs> 
so, so is the idea behind the tax control triangle, um, is it like the idea that you want to diversify and put a little bit in each corner, or is it more like you want to focus on like the tax free post tax? It's a great like, question. Well, what's the implementation of, of this information? That's a great question. So most people, like I said, they, have, they already have a lot of this, they have some of this, but no one really has any of this. Our idea is, you know, I've, I've, uh, I think uh, Shayla was with me. I sat down with like a teamster and his wife and they're like, we're pretty covered. You know, we have like a 401k that's invested pretty well. And, you know, we, we invest in our stocks and our bonds. And the thing is, uh, it seems like we're pretty good. And I told them like, you know, your, your policy actually pays out tax free. And they're like, wait, tax free. What, what does that even mean? So we sat down, I said, well, I was like, oh, this, this is it. This is where you're going to break this baby out. And obviously don't do it your first try. You know, uh, this video will be recorded. And so you guys can watch this a few times and there's another video with Tommy doing it as well, but th don't do this your first try because you're gonna mess up. And I promise you I messed up my first time too. The lady I sat down with was really confused, but when I got it down and I whipped it, like you whip it out like this, you're, they're like, oh wow, like, wait, you can, they see it. They see their own needs right away. But like, okay, yeah, oh, I actually I actually have a pension because I'm, I'm in the union of my, my wife's a teacher, so she follows a 403B. And you know what? We're, we're pretty smart. We went to college. You know, we, we were like, okay, let's, let's make sure we're, we're well-rounded. Let's keep money in investments, like diversify our portfolio, diversify in stocks, bonds, real estate, whatever it is. But no one does this. No one, no one puts their money into municipal bonds. Some people do put their money into Roth IRAs, 100%, but not properly, not funded to the max, not the way you can check off all the boxes in your list to make sure I'm planning, uh, my financial planning is done properly and set for the future. Does, does that help answer the question? Yeah. Ah, for sure. Awesome. Can I, can I add something? <laughs> What's up, man? So like when, um, I mean, I've, I've tried doing this a couple of times. Um, it, it is kind of confusing to get it down 100% and make them not confused, but uh, they, they call, I've heard, I've heard Tommy say it, you know, when the point is to like show them this and because obviously we're trying to sell them whole life insurance. So right. You tell them cash value whole life, they actually call that the rich man's Roth because Roth IRA, you know, if you make more than 150K, you can't actually contribute to it. You see a lot of, you know, wealthy people take out a large, really large, like whole life policy uh, because it provides a couple benefits. It, you know, it provides a tax free income later in life, uh, but at the same time, there's no early withdrawal fees. You know, you can take out that cash value if you need it early, uh, and you're not going to get penalized for it. And at the same time, if something happens to you, you got the you got you the, the death benefit. Yeah, the death benefit exactly. So that's like one way to kind of like close it out and you know set it up where they're starting to think about yeah, maybe I need to pull that. No, exactly, exactly. Hundred percent. That's a great point, Sid. Yeah. What's up, Marissa? Um, I'm just wondering, so like what he was saying, like with the cash value, so like something that you would maybe suggest, you know, if they want to do more investing, like if they do have a whole life policy and obviously they're pretty well, so yeah. like if it is a larger policy, would you ever suggest like taking out the cash value, investing it into something else and then paying it back to themselves later before they get penalized at the cash one? Yeah, hundred percent. Uh, that's a great, that's a lot of people. I, I wasn't going to go over this, but a lot of people, what they do is like what Steven did, what Steven just said, they take really big whole life policies. And when they build up enough cash value, they can actually use that as down payments on real estate. And what they do is with real estate, you, you have leverage, you, uh, you put a certain amount down and you're financing the rest, right? right? But based on what leverage you have and you sell the house at a certain amount of profit, the amount that you like the cash you put in, it, it multiplies because the leverage factor. So your money can actually like triple, quadruple, really, really fast real estate. So what they'll do is they'll put money, they'll take their cash value life insurance, they'll take it out because it's tax free, they didn't pay any income on it, right? Mm -hmm. They'll put it back into this real estate. They'll, what they'll do with the real estate is they'll flip the real estate. They'll get it, they'll, you know, huge build return. up huge return, pay themselves back and they took a gain and now what? They actually lowered their gain because they paid themselves back on a loan. And so they're paying another, difference uh it's a lower tax bracket depending on how big the loan was yeah and so, there's no fee for the for the whole life because they don't have to they don't have to pay any fees to get the money. money they don't have to go to the bank they don't have to go get like a loan they don't have so to they don't have to pay it back too right like, 
Yeah, well, like with you your whole life. From the, from the exactly. And, and as you guys all know, especially like, because we're all, we all have been doing this for a little bit, or even if you're new, when you take a loan out of your policy, there is a, there's a rate that the company charges out of the death benefit, right? Now, it's not like crazy significant unless like you have like a huge policy and like you took a bunch of money out. That's why people try to really just put the money back into real estate, flip it, put it right back to themselves out and they're taking a really, really nice deal. There's a great YouTube video I can post on, uh, on like the group as well that I saw on that. But any other questions, guys? Anyone on Zoom? Anyone have questions on the tax control triangle? Yeah, right. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, what's up, Faye Jones? Okay, so just like I th as is another way that you could kind of like beat up or like you know get the cash value life insurance like you know a benefit about it is that like how that money like Stephen was kind of saying it's like there's no withdrawal fees like it's like I feel like some people are like well oh well, you know I have like a IRA or you know my retirement and I'm like but and they think this money's like so accessible but you know it's not accessible in the way whereas obviously a death benefit's guaranteed with us you could get that money within three to five days and also there's no withdrawal fees. So could that be another way? Like, hey guys, like, do you know how long it takes for someone to receive that money? Like it has to be a process, right? Like, I feel like it's not just like, oh, I want some money. Let me just go pull it out. Like it's a, is that like a thing? Like, do you know how long it takes? Or, you know, like, is that like an argument you could use? Uh, like how long it takes to get your money out of your whole life policy? But com yeah, that compared to if you're trying to take money out of your um, retirement or your IRA or something. Okay, yeah, great. That's a, that's a great, that's a great uh, thing to point out. So like, uh, kind of like we were saying at certain ages, if you try to take money out of like your IRA or your 401ks and stuff, they penalize you and they tax you. Zero, 10%. Yeah, it could be like 10%, like Steven said. And that, that's a lot of money if you- On and, top of like- in, in, On top of the ordinary income tax, exactly. Ordinary earned income tax. So- um, that, that's a great point. But the thing is when people like try to like clear out like their 401ks or 403bs, as soon as you start taking money out, the money stops growing in your 401k. So uh, also like as soon as you start taking like withdrawals from it, 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 it doesn't grow anymore. It, it, you're ready to retire. So it just starts paying you out. So as soon as you take money out of a 401k or IRA, it stops growing? Uh, if I'm correct, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure it stops growing. After you, uh, after you put the money in. Right. Up. Question. Question. Is that the same thing with your whole life policy too? As soon as you take cash value out, does your money also stop to grow? Yeah. As soon as you do take your money out of your whole life policy, it, it, it does. Uh, 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 well, the money that you put in, that you keep putting in, it's contributing, but I, I'm pretty sure it stops growing as well. Once you start taking payment, you took a loan out until you I haven't back, I think your money stops growing. But correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not like spot on with that. I would ask uh, definitely like maybe like Gio or Vince for that one for sure. I have another question too. So you, you know how cash value, it usually takes what, two years for it to start to grow? Yeah. You, you, uh, so what if someone like just playing devil's advocate, what if they're like, all right, I'd rather put my money into stocks where I can get a quicker return than wait two years for my money to start to grow and then still wait for it to build up to be able to take it out? Yeah, no, 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 that's a, great. You want to play the devil's advocate because uh, a lot of people will say that. You put your money in the stocks for two years and it can grow for sure. But let's say if you died within that two years time frame while you were investing in that stock, whatever money you had in that investment, you, you, yeah, sure, you have the money in the investment. It's cool. That's good. You, you grew some money. But if you died in that two years, what? how much is going to pay out compared to your cash value of life policy? So you, you, you play it like that. You're like, yeah, it's great. And, and I, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. It's honestly something you should do. You're not supposed to pick one over the other. The main thing is, is to have a balance of all three. So you're gotcha. not taxed really heavily on one side here. You're not taxed really heavily on one side here. Or you're not threw a bunch of money into your cash value life insurance. You don't have investments that grew at higher rates than you wanted. Like, you know, these don't grow at crazy high interest rates. Like, are our, our whole life policy goes at 4.5%, but let's say on a like per annual re, uh, yield on like a, some indexes, you can get like 10 to 12% if you look at a 12 year or like a 10 year span, like 10 to 12%. And you throw that, like let's say your stocks or your mutual funds or even in real estate, it, your gain is significantly higher, but your risk is also significantly higher. What we're doing is balancing out risk and your gain. 
uh, that's how you diversify your portfolio. So that's kind of, uh, but that, that's also a really good point as well, Marvin. Good job. Uh, is there any other questions I can answer? So uh, if anyone's confused or anything or anything like that. No, good. Good to go. CMG, what's up, man? Um, so I, I watched a, a video the other night. The, the title of the video was literally, is whole life insurance a scam? And it was the whole, uh, the whole thing. It was the whole, like, uh, just buy term and invest the rest because investing the rest, uh, grows at a higher, uh, grows at a higher rate. And so, it, so I'm wondering, like, with it, with this tax control plan, with this idea, of that notion of buy term and invest the rest because of the, because of like the, the tax, the tax free status and the guarantee. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Like, if you even go down to a financial advisor, they're never gonna like any real financial advisor is never gonna tell you to just buy a bunch of term. They're gonna be like diversify, have some whole life for your death benefit and term for your if you know what when for your if and your when, and then like annuities and like give like they they do a bunch of different things, right? But what we're focused on here is like what you said, like oh I'll just buy term and invest the rest. Hundred percent, you you should get some term. Term is a great option. But the thing is, we also need to make sure we have some guarantee set up for the family. That way, and like, you know, the same way you beat up term on any other policy. Show them, you, you pull out their term or whatever. You show them their, their, uh, the table of rates where you, at a certain age, you see that price really jump up. You go a little down deep and you're like, wow, you're, you want to pay $1,000 a month for this $200,000 policy? Okay, no, I didn't think so. Let's get, get you some whole life, my friend. Hey, uh, hey, Reich. Hey, what's up, brother? I was just uh, wondering if I could just add something real quick to what you're talking about and just tell you that, you know, I used to do financial service planning, right? Every single thing you have on that board has a purpose and has a place, yeah. right? So when for us to beat it, we kind of have to understand what are we comparing ourselves to? And out of those things, if you maybe you could go over with the group, what is the guaranteed? Because everything else you have there is associated, has a risk with it, possibly a downside, possibly losing value. But like CDs, for example, guaranteed. Bonds, for example, guaranteed. Yeah. So maybe you could just go over with the group which ones are actually guaranteed. So you're comparing apples to apples in terms of like rates, 100%. right? Yeah, no. And I think that would be useful. Yeah, yeah no, de definitely. And, and man, I, I had no idea you had that financial background. That's fire. That's good, man. Well, I, I'll tell you what, you're right. There are some things that are not guaranteed. There's something that's are guaranteed. And like Matt said, your CDs are guaranteed. These are stuff you can get at like a bank. And you go to your bank and you'll be like, oh, let me get a cash deposit and they'll give you a price. And they'll be like, oh, I'll pay that. And you grow your money and then you pay taxes on like, if you grow at 5%, you do pay tax on that 5%. But that's guaranteed. Bonds, they're guaranteed. Guaranteed interest rates. Your cash value life insurance, that's a guarantee. Your Roth IRA, right, there's a guaranteed growth. I would say there's guaranteed growth, but it's not like a guaranteed certain rate because it can change year by year. Is that is that correct, Matt? Depending on what you yeah. Invest. Last last I checked, your Roth will go between five and seven on average, depending. There you go, five and seven right there. Municipal bonds guaranteed. These are from like the state. Uh, triple tax exempt, all guaranteed. Uh, what else is guaranteed? Your 401k is not guaranteed. Your 401k can change based on how the market is. Uh, I think if you guys remember, if you had, like your parents had a lot of money in their 401k or something, uh, when that like stock market crashed, they were like, I lost so much money in my retirement or whatever. That That's because these are, these deal with the market. These are in there. But uh, your pension, uh, I want to say your pension is guaranteed, but sometimes, uh, you know, you they'll cut people's pensions based on like certain things or whatever happens in that union or if like, you know, so, somewhere the union did something wrong and, you know, now a lot of people lost their pensions or that union or whatever, put their money into some fund and that fund was in a good fund and they lost all their money. Then those people lost their pensions, but pensions are guaranteed. Oh, they are? Like, they're like for the most part, like if you, you could lose your pension for sure, like, but like you, you, you should, if everything works properly with the union and everything's good to go and you put your years in and you put your years out, that that should be guaranteed for your family. Now, now it's not always because there's some things that do happen with like unions and like the local and like a lot of different things. Are we even, I'm sure you could sat down with someone and they're like, oh, I cut my pension. They added, it told me for me to get my full pension after working extra three years now. 
Yeah, and stuff like that. But like, if, if you do it to the T, like that, that will be guaranteed money for your family. So should pensions go into guaranteed or not guaranteed college? Uh, I would say a little bit of if because, but like they are like guaranteed for like your unions, but sometimes they they're not. Like some things happen. Sometimes stuff happens. Because I've heard a lot. I've known a lot of older guys who they had a good they had a good pension, but then when they retired, they didn't because of something that happened at their workplace. Or yeah. Whatever. So pensions, like in their contract, it said you're supposed to get this much money. Like, uh, you're like here, like if you put in 30 years, like you'll get an X amount of your annual income out as in your pension. And then that, that you'll be good to go. But that's because they took that money and they gave it to like some company or some fund to invest in or like a hedge fund or whatever it is. They, invest, they asked them to invest it. And if that wasn't invested properly or, you know, they were taking a lot of withdrawals from it or using that money to do other things, the pensions. Like, you know, the, the money was used. So obviously they don't have it anymore. So, so that's what happens when people talk about, because obviously I'm sure everyone's heard from some union guy about how there's something not right going on with the pension or how the pension for this union is going down instead of going up or it's like a smaller amount than it should be or something like that. So that's what happens to the pension? Yeah, it depends how like the whoever was handling that pension was invested in it or like what, how they invested it. Uh, I'm not like super familiar on that end, but I do know that I've heard that that's like happened before. Like, like companies are like, you know, like the firefighters or something put their money. I actually just saw it on TV. I lied. I saw it on like a TV show and they're like, yeah, we put our money in the fund and they lost all the money. And I was like, oh man, this, this is horrible. I guess this could happen in real life too. Right. But, and it's true. It's true. It definitely could happen if they invested it wrong. And, 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 and you know, Matt has a better background on that than I would. If it, it, is that correct? Am, am I correct on that? Like, it could. Yeah. The thing is, any pension program would be professionally managed by someone with at least a CFP and a Series Sevens license, right? That doesn't mean they can't screw it up. That doesn't yeah, mean market yeah. conditions can't go bad. It doesn't mean like they could stop having union members or state employees paying into the pension so people can take out of it. At the state of Illinois, for example, the teachers' pensions and the state employees huge huge problems there they're massively underfunded meaning they don't have enough people to pay in in order to pay out what they already are obliged to pay out and they're gonna have to pay out more in the future ergo taxes are going up here in the state of illinois for forever right so they're gonna have to find some money somewhere but for the union guys that we work with same thing they have to have people from the union paying into their pension program or they're not going to have funds to pay out the people that have already gone before if that makes sense no yeah yeah if there's people not consistently contributing uh, they won't, they won't get the money. So, sorry, this is all like totally new to me. This is an yeah. area I'm unfamiliar with. So, so basically the way pensions work is, is they take money from the employees who are paying in working there. They invest that money, which is supposed to grow. And then when those employees retire, they, they, they get money out of that, that pension fund that's supposed to be growing after invested. But then sometimes based on how that investment is handled, based on how many people are coming in and working and how many people are retiring that pension might not be where it needs to be in order to keep paying everyone who's who's retired. Is, is, am I understanding this right? Exactly. Okay. I am learning a lot today. For sure. That's good. I'm glad you are learning, Stevie Shea. I hope everyone is. <laughs> For I sure, have, guys. I have one more question. Uh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Um, I know that you said that like they're short term and they're long term. So like, what is the difference? Like, short term within one year. Yeah. Within one, one year. year. Mm -hmm. Long term is that after one year. After okay. Thanks, Stephen Ellis. Me, me and Stephen Ellis both majored in college and finance. <laughs> what was her question? I didn't hear it. Oh, uh, well, uh, what's the time frame for short term? What's the time frame for long term? Like for uh, capital gains taxes. All right, all right. For sure, guys. But any other questions I can answer on this, or if anything that was unclear that I can like help clarify before we kind of move forward. Good, good to go. Awesome, cool guys. Last thing I'll go over is not complicated at all. It's super, super simple. And uh, one day I sat down with Tommy. And I was like, man, Tommy, I don't know what to do. This is like my second week into the business. And I was like, man, I don't know what to do. And there's like five people in here as well. So so I had the time, I was like, oh, I can find Tommy and I just grabbed him. But uh, uh, it was super cool. It was like, I was like, hey, I'm sitting down with this very young person and like, I don't know if they're going to want life insurance. Like, you know, like they're like, I, I don't understand. Like, I, what, what, do, what do I say if they're like, I just want to wait or something. 
And then Tommy sat me down. It's like, you, you can't wait. You can't wait on your life insurance. It's the most important thing. So he showed me what happens if you wait. So let's say uh, I'm 23 years old. Let's say you, we use the example of 25 years old, right? You're 25 years old and you get a $100,000 policy. You're gonna pay that for 40 years and you pay that till 65 years old. You're 65 years old and at that point you pay into that policy every single month, $65.67 which is 788 ALP. 788 ALP times 40 years is your paid in, like how much money you paid into this policy. Paid in 31,521. Now your cash value at that point is gonna be 36,000 426 and you reduce paid up everyone knows what their rpus are right everyone knows what the rpu is if you have cash value in the policy they don't want to ever pay the policy again they can just use that cash value and it, it's settled like they'll always pay an x amount of money back to your family cool so that's your rpu and that's going to be eighty three thousand eight hundred dollars now that's if you're 25 and let's say you're sitting down with a 25 year old and it's like, Hey man, like I'm 25. I'm still young. I don't think I'm going to die anytime soon. I can just wait. I'll just get this a little bit older when like, you know, I have like family, some more responsibilities, maybe another kid. Then you're like, wait, wait, look, let me show you what happens when, when you wait, let me show you what actually, how much money you lose when you wait. And the numbers on this aren't, aren't exact at all, like the numbers for the cash value, but when you show it like this and you look at the comparison, they'll be like, I'm, I'm sure. So now let's say you're 35 years old and you only pay for 30 years. So you're 65, you waited 10 years. Now you're paying same 100K policy. You're paying a little bit more like $104 a month, 92 cents, which is, uh, 1259 ALP, 1259 ALP. And that means your paid in option over 30 years, which you paid 30 years into this policy is 37,771. Now your cash value is 32,738. And your reduced paid up is gonna be 75,300. Now you show them, like obviously you guys can tell, like these numbers are a lot different, but then you do some really, it's not like actual math, because the difference is like not what it is, but you just show them this, you're like, oh, okay, from, if you waited 10 years right now, you basically just lost, yeah, about $6,200 right there. So the difference is like about 6,200 right there. You're at 36 to 32. Okay, you lost about another four thousand dollars right there, and 83 to 75. Okay, it, it, you bought. You lost about another seventy-five hundred dollars right, right there. Put that in total: 10, 17, 17,700. Let's call it seventeen thousand seven hundred. And I'll just be like, you basically lost twenty thousand dollars just waiting ten years. So if people say they're gonna wait. You just show them what what happens when you wait. So that's why, Joe, you know, whether, whether it's option A, B, or C, the main thing is we lock in your health and your age. So that way you'll never have to worry about this ever again, all right? And you got paid up, paid in, cash value, reduced paid up. And I will recommend, guys, you won't, you typically want to use the age 25 and 35 and 100K. Don't use 50K. The cash value numbers don't look as nice. Don't use 27 and 34 because the difference wouldn't look as good. You wanna use like these really simple numbers because your cash value does, like your, you won't see your cash value grow as much when you start getting it older, you know? Like sometimes you will, uh, you, you'll pay more than your cash value will ever build. And, and that happens because you bought the, you get the policy a lot later than you should have, right? You should get life insurance when you're healthy and young. But let's say if you got it when you're young and your cash value builds more than what you've ever paid in, it looks a lot nicer. So. 25 and 35 are the ages to go. 
Don't use, or you can use anywhere, anywhere below 25, but nothing above like 35. Cause you're going to like show them if you use 35 and 45, those numbers don't look nice. That difference is still like a loss of money, no matter what, like on your end. So just make sure you show them 25, 35 paid in cash value, reduced paid up. Show them what happens when you pay 40 years in the policy and when you have, happens when you just pay 30 years and how much money you'll lose if you just wait 10 years. Any questions on that? That, that one's a lot simpler, right? Make sense, guys? That was fire. Thank you. Yes, sir. But if you guys do have any questions, that's kind of that's kind of what all I have for today. But if you have any other questions, feel free to shoot me a text or like, you know, say it right here or a call, uh, whatever it is, or hit me up at the group meet. But other than that, oh, Stephen Ellis, what's up, man? I was just going to add something, too, because, like, you know, it, we don't always get so lucky to sit down with someone so young. Or, oh, no, we don't. We don't. But um, even if, like, they are 35 and, like, you know, maybe they just don't see the value and you show them something like this with the 35 numbers. I mean, either way, like, yeah, they may pay 37 grand into it over the next 30 years. Uh, but, you know, the whole reason you get life insurance is for your family, right? Like, you want to leave money behind. Mm -hmm. So even if they did pay 37,000 and, like, it doesn't, you know, they pay more into it than their cash value is, um, either way, if something happens to them, they're still going to, still gonna pay out a hundred thousand. So you know they're yeah. getting sixty grand for their family plus sixty five comes around they take their repaid up option. They're guaranteed death benefit seventy five thousand. They're still doubling their money. Yeah no matter what no like no matter what no matter what you don't you don't lose money on life insurance. I'm like a unless you're the over the age of sixty five you'll never pay more into your pol on age of the over over the age of sixty I would say you'll never pay more than your policy is ever worth. Never. Just, just can't don't live that long enough to do it. So right off of that, then how would you go about trying to try to convert that into this? I've, I've ran into this a lot lately where it's like, well, if I'm paying $88 and I'm 60 something right now, like I'm gonna be paying more than what my policy's worth. And what I've just like understood is that it's just like the cost of insurance. So it goes up. So, but it's only for like a seven or $10,000 policy. So, I mean, like, how do you like, I mean, you're not going to use this. I'm no, telling you, that, know, yeah, you're not I using know. this. Yeah, I know. For That's sure. going to piss them off. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm just saying, like, when you're in that situation, like, how are you actually going to explain it to them? Oh, like, yeah, yeah, great question. So, honestly, you got to just tell them, like, that that's the price. And I, though, I've sold, like, a very old woman. I have a really good recording of it. And, I, and honestly, all it is, you're just going back and forth. They have to understand that you're going to get no a bunch of times because no one wants to pay $88 for like $5,000 worth of life insurance. No, right. it's not. I don't, but they need to because if they don't, they're not going to use that $88 anywhere else. They're not going to save it. They're not going to put it for their kids. They might buy like some snacks. They might go get some more fast food. They might get some more like uh, an extra dinner with their family, whatever it is. But they're not using that money the way the life insurance would get that money. So you have to really just go back and forth with them. And I, I'll, for personally, in my case, I just go on a closing battle on that. And then like, we go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And eventually they, they'll say yes, they'll say yes. But yeah. I'd it's, say you know, for something like that, if they're that old and like they don't have life insurance, it's probably because they're not like the, you know, smartest, wealthiest people, or they are like extremely wealthy and it's like they have a lot of money in other areas where they don't feel the need for life insurance. Yeah. But like Greg said, you know, if they don't have life insurance at that point, you're paying for the guarantee because they're not going to use, it's not like buy term best for us where they're actually going to like use that money they're saving from not buying life insurance and put it towards something that's going to like provide money for the family. They're going to spend it on food, food something, like, something. like in anything. They're not going to put it to their family. And it's going to get to the point, like something happens to them and then, you know, their family's going to have to come up with 15, 20K for, you know. Yeah. So, so how would you put that to them, like in, in a gentle way? How, how do you, if they're like, I'm not going to pay $88 a month just so my family gets uh, $10,000 when I die. It's like, I'm going to pay more than $10,000 into it before I die. How do you say to them? Yeah, but in that, in that time, you're not going to be spending, you're not going to be saving that $88 so your family doesn't have to do that. Like, do you understand what I'm asking? Yeah. Yeah. So at that point, you have to have built rapport. You have to have a relationship with a client like that. So you, you can't really say this in a very gentle way. Well, 
they're gonna get it. Like you gotta be straight up with them. Like, like they, you, everyone says things in gentle ways to them. That's why they don't understand. That's why they don't get it. Like they don't, they're, they're obviously, they, like Steven said, they're either not the sharpest like knife in the fucking drawer or whatever it is, <laughs> or, or, or they're very, very well off. Like, you know what, it's one or the other. Or like they just are very bad at planning. One of the, like one of those three, right? At that point, bro, like you, you got to be straight up with them. You have to have built a relationship with that sit. That's why we, that's why we harp on making fifteen minutes of rapport, even in like a virtual sit, because then you're cool. Like you're cool. You can establish. You can be real with them. You're here to help their family. You're not here to sell them. You have to make sure they understand that you're here to help their family. You can't come off as a salesman. So when you be real with them, you're, you're not showing them like, hey, I'm I'm Stephen Shilly, the salesman. I'm Stephen Shilly, your boy. Or I guess not, these are old people. Like, I'm Steven Chu, I'm like your grandson. Like, I'm here to help you. Like, like I'm not I'm not here to mislead you. I'm not here to take you wrong. I'm telling you this because I've seen it. Like, you don't say like that because that's not a good tactic to use. But uh, uh, but you, you, you know what I mean? Like, you've seen it. Like, you see, you see uh, an old person that doesn't have any life insurance. They're like, I don't want to pay the money. And then you, I can guarantee you, you can guess what happens next. They die. And they don't have life insurance and their families end up in a really bad spot and you know their kids are running around trying to get the money together so i've seen it i've sat down families have seen it so you got to really instill that into yourself or your wife to make sure you be real with them to tell them like hey like this this is what it is look you're not you're not getting any younger you're 68 or <laughs> whatever it is right so like, so so could you basically like if someone says something like that it, could, could you kind of be very direct and say well um after, after, are you going to then take this money that you would be paying on life insurance? Are you going to put that in a savings account and never ever spend any of it and leave that solely for your funeral? Like, can you ask them a direct question like that? So, is that, is that a tool to use? You, you can, a hundred percent. You can ask a hundred direct question. Now, it depends on how the relationship is built. Like I said, you can get either kicked out of the house for saying that, <laughs> or, uh, or you could, or it's going to hit home for them because no one's ever been real with them before. So it, it depends on the client, dude. It depends on the client, depends on the relationship you build. I, I will say I've never, in my personal like experience, I've never been very soft with it and it went through. Like I've never been soft after this lady is like, well, I don't want to pay the $88. Like I can't be soft. Or just, I know I'm not going to close them down. Like I, you, you got to be real with them. You got to make sure they know you, you, they like you for you, not because they like the product. Like they obviously like the product, but you know, they buy you, they buy the company and they buy the product. Mm -hmm. I suppose another thing you could say there, thinking about it, it's like, um, uh, sure thing, Mary, but it'll take you, like, if it's $88 a month for a $10,000 policy, like, it'll take you just, uh, like, 10 years to save up that, that money if you were paying $88 a month. But we, we're not promised tomorrow. You don't know what could happen between now and when you actually save up $10,000. Exactly. But, but if you were to be paying this $88 a month, should anything happen? it'd be as if you had saved for even longer, okay. right? You can say that. Yeah, and also remember guys, this senior grade, po these policies for seniors are all great. So like, at the end, make sure you guys are telling them like these are great policies. Like at the end of it, be like, you, you, you think you're gonna live more than four years, right? Like at the end, like real end, like real end, don't say at the beginning or anything. That, you're, that's not gonna sell that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for sure. I can add stuff on that that Vince told me. Um, apparently like in, in Pennsylvania, they don't have they don't have graded. They don't have graded. It's not but graded. It's, but it's like a lot more expensive. Yeah. You know, to even fail. Yeah, that for, I guess in the state of Illinois, all senior whole life is graded. It's like a regulated thing, you know, so. And then, you know, some 25% for like explain how it works, then you can say what you said. Like, you know, you're not going to. Yeah, you're like, you, you guys are going to live longer than four years, right? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah. But. Yeah, make sure you tell every single policy member that you sold that's over the age of 60 that their policy is either graded, that that is graded. Let them know, because it's illegal not to let them know. Make sure you guys do that. If you guys haven't told someone, uh, tell the next client you sold. Make sure you don't. Yeah. But uh, other than that, guys, if you do have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out. Uh, if you don't have my number, I'll put it in like the group chat or something if you want to shoot me a text if you have any questions. Other than that, you guys have a good day. I'm going to end this call. All right, Steven, you Great job, Rike. Thank you, Rike. Let's go, let's go, Rike. Thank you, Rike. Good job, bro. Thank you, Rike.